He may first have come to fame as a Marxist cultural theorist, but he's always been engaged with Christian and particularly Catholic thought. In his new book, Culture and the Death of God, he challenges the orthodoxy that sees the Enlightenment as a sustained attack upon the sacred. And in a quick hop, skip and a jump through post-Enlightenment thought, he shows how much the surrogates we invented to replace religion, not least culture, have an unnerving knack of letting the Almighty back into the picture. It's only at the end of the book that he clearly states his belief that we need religious faith more than ever in a faithless world if our forms of life are to be reborn as just and compassionate communities. Why is religion making such a return to public life, I asked him, down the line to Virginia and the United States? There has been a resurgence of interest in religious faith. It's been widespread throughout the political left, which is an unusual place for it to be. But, you see, I think that quite a few of the books that have come out on this subject are really trying to sort of, in my view, buy their sort of religion on the cheap. They're trying to hijack a certain sort of spirituality of a rather disembodied kind for a, an advanced capitalist society that very notably lacks it, and in a sense, it then becomes sort of the icing on the cake. One of the features of advanced capitalist societies is that they're extremely faithless. I mean, faith just doesn't really enter into them. You know, what you believe or don't believe is not that important, as long as you do the right things and so on. So You say, in effect, it's been privatised. Faith has been privatised along with art and sexuality, and this, in one sense, is a magnificent gain. Nobody breaks down your bedroom door anymore. Nobody demands that you believe something religiously and so on. At the same time, these things become rather dysfunctional. Nobody knows quite what to do with them. No sooner had, as it were, advanced postmodern capitalism become faithless, thought it had finally dispensed with God, and my claim is that dispensing with God is extremely difficult, for societies. No sooner had that happened than um, two aircraft slammed into the World Trade Center and a whole new narrative of faith and God and fundamentalism and atheism and so on opened up again. And I find that fascinating. It is, and I want to come back to that, but I want us to let a whiff of history into this discussion, which you do. And you've got an interesting argument about the Enlightenment, which is, you know, there's a certain orthodoxy about the Enlightenment, which is it unraveled religion, it unraveled faith, it installed secularism in its place. You don't believe that. No, I, I don't really, Philip, and, and I think neither do a lot of commentators these days on the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment wasn't so much opposed to God. I mean, there were very, very few atheists in the 18th century. It was opposed to priestcraft. It was opposed to the, you know, scheming, wicked, <laughs> clerical class. And uh, my argument is in part that what happens is that the Enlightenment sets up reason as a kind of surrogate for divinity. I mean, that's not a particularly original argument, but it's the beginning of an argument that the modern period is littered with the bust remains of a whole series of attempted substitutes for God from reason, to nature, art, culture, the nation, the state, none of which really succeed, I think, for interesting reasons. Why is it that culture, nature, art, why is it that these are put in the place of God. To put it this way, what is think, absent when God dies? Yeah. Well, I think the reason these surrogates, these viceroys for the Almighty are wheeled up is actually because of a kind of mistake. It's the mistake of believing that political order is based upon morality. Morality is based in turn upon the deity, and if you kick away the foundation of the deity, then political stability will come clattering down. All of this so-called religious argument reflects a real deep-seated political fear. Now, I say that's a mistake because I think, actually, it's not the case that morality, so civic morality, comes clattering down if you take away the divine basis. Most people don't derive their morality from a divine basis. But there's a very real fear that if you dispense with God and don't put anything in his place, then you're going to have disaffection on your hands. And that, in, I suppose, is the argument you're partly having with your own younger self about the role of culture, which is there was a time, and you and I were both brought up with it, when culture could save us. You want yes. to, as it were, yes. challenge that. 
I think, Philip, I've always wanted, although, you know, culture is my business, in a sense, intellectually, I've also always wanted to try and put it back in its place, because it gets very overweening, doesn't it, as a concept? I mean, you know, culturalism, as I call it, the belief that everything is culture, that culture goes all the way down, that we're cultural beings through and through. I don't believe that. I'm, a, you know, as you know, a good old-fashioned materialist when it comes to that. But I do think that culture was perhaps the most successful of these various vices Roy's for the Almighty that modernity has kept wheeling and why, in. Why, what it, was it about culture that made it the most effective, Viceroy? I think, what, I think that cult, because culture means two different things. One is the narrow aesthetic meaning of the arts, ideas and so on. The other is the much broader anthropological meaning of a way of life. And there was the hope, there was the aspiration that you could bring those two things together. Yes, you could bring together the concerns of a coterie, an intellectual coterie, with the belief, practices, customs of the mass of the people. That actually didn't work out. The two meanings of culture split apart in the 20th century, and the point about religion is that, or one of many points about it, I guess, is that it could, it could bring those two different meanings together. Religion is a matter of the priesthood and the laity, of transcendent truths and everyday practice, of billions and billions of people. It's the most successful symbolic system history has ever witnessed and even culture couldn't hold a candle to it in the end. It's a very telling sentence and at one level historically there's good grounds for it but you know as well as I do that this is the first moment I've ever heard you sound like T.S. Eliot with his dissociation of sensibility, that great moment in the 17th century when Protestant, and I was brought up as a Protestant, Terry, when know, Protestantism <laughs> broke into the world and split aside the elite and the popular, the individual well, and the communal. There is a kind of harking back, which may be a harking forward too in what you say, an image of a kind of unity. I don't believe these two meanings of culture were ever unified, Philip. I really do think that's an illusion, and I don't think that those nostalgic and organic illusions help. Those two meanings of culture were always quite rigorously separate. What's happened in our own time is that culture in the broad way of life sense, which for people like Eliot was a locus of reconciliation, has become a zone of contention. You know, I'm now getting fed up of saying uh, culture today is what people will kill for or will die for. Belief, uh, identity, symbol, language, community, all of that now is a zone of contention. And that's one reason why the concept of culture comes into crisis, because it used to be where we could all get together. I was much more thinking that you were making of religion this extraordinary, potentially unifying force. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, potentially, in principle, yes. Not because historically, in prin just potentially. No, no not, not the least. I mean, religion surely has been at least as divisive as it's converged people together. What I meant was that no other symbolic system in history is able to make a direct link between the daily behaviour and beliefs of billions of people and certain supposedly transcendent, absolute, imperishable truths. Culture tried to do that in its day, and it failed. It couldn't match that. In order for it to play that role, if I might put it in that slightly functional way, it entails belief in people, doesn't it? Do you think faith is making a return. It is, you know, the return of the repressed, as someone might have called it. Well, maybe, maybe. But, I mean, first of all, there's a kind of mistake that isn't there that people make about faith. When atheists and religious people talk about faith, they normally... You know, they talk about it in what I've called elsewhere the Yeti theory of faith. You know, do you believe a certain creature called the Yeti or the supreme being exists or don't you? Well, that may be an interesting question, but it's sure not what tradition from Abraham to Jesus and onwards believes by faith. For that tradition, faith is a passionate conviction and commitment for which people are prepared to give their lives if necessary. It isn't, as the Enlightenment thought, a rather abstract and cerebral notion of whether you subscribe to a supreme being. Now, I don't think, I mean, confronted with a fundamentalist world, you know, all the way from certain Muslim societies to Montana, 
Yes, certainly faith in the worst sense of fanatical conviction has reared its head once again. But what I try and do in the book is set that in context historically and say, look, that's simply the flip side of a society, an advanced capitalist society, which has no time for belief which just siphons it off elsewhere. As, as Yeats famously said, you know, that the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Those two things, the faithlessness of our societies and fundamentalism, are sides of the same coin. But you think, and you'll hate me saying this, that there's a third way... Yes, I think there is a third way, and I think that's partly to try and re-establish some reasonable, some decent, uh, if you like, some radical theory of faith that wouldn't fall into this intellectualist trap on the one hand or wouldn't fall into the fundamentalist error on the other. I don't think that's impossible. Well, it's interesting because, of course, most books always end where I want them to begin, and yours ends with this... <laughs> clarion call to a reintegration in terms of ambition of culture, politics and religion. Is it anything more than a wish, do you think? It's a hope. Well, I think it is a bit, yeah, because I think the one characteristic of late modern society is actually it does begin to bring these things together again. Think about, say, cultural politics. Now, Cultural politics for high modernity is a kind of contradiction in terms because culture is one thing and politics is a much more prosaic and dreary, you know, mundane business. One of the things that's happened in our own time, of course, is that culture has become intensely repoliticized. Now, not entirely for the good, to be sure, you know, as I said, culture is what you will kill for. But it's also come out of the closet in a certain way. Since Matthew Arnold in the 19th century, culture can no longer afford politically to be simply the privileged values of a few, you know, and we've been extending that process in our own time. The religion that you speak of and I think that you value, and I, I take this not only from this book, also from your memoir, where I remember very clearly your account of the nuns who felt in such kind of despair at this world that they withdrew from it. And you speak at the end of this book, you know, that the New Testament is not a civilised document. You're still drawn to that kind of apocalyptic religion of transformation and metamorphosis and transcendence. Well, I'd agree with all that, Philip, except for the word apocalyptic, which I think is different. And the nuns I served mass for when I was a kid, when I was an altar server, didn't regard their withdrawal from the world as a matter of despair. You know, they saw themselves as suffering on behalf of the world and with the world. And, um, you know, uh, yes, I mean, I was very impressed by that um, because it seemed to me that here were some enormously cheerful and positive women living in a kind of feminine community with one another whose very lifestyle constituted a sort of implicit critique of the world around them. They were kind of communists, they shared all things together. And, um, you know, that vein of Christianity has, of course, continued um, under great siege, but I, I still feel a certain loyalty to that. In fact, one of the young nuns who, I think she was 18 at the time in the convent, she was a novice, and she remembers me as an altar server when I was eight or nine. She read my memoir, and she read about her community, and she actually wrote to me, which she wouldn't have been allowed to do in those days. She's now in her 80s, and I went to see her, and she described this horrific life, it sounded like, you know, of deprivation and, and so on, and she said, we had great fun. <laughs> and that, that really struck me, you know, that it wasn't for them a matter of gloom and despair and dissociation. It was a kind of affirmation. Do you think the book, uh, your audience for this book is what one might call the liberal left, who are slightly nose in the area air about religion without understanding its potential power? Is that your audience? Oh, I, I, ne <laughs> I never know what my audience is. I never, never even, first of all, I never know why I write a book. Uh, so maybe ten years later I can look back and see what it was all about. And secondly, I never have a sense of an audience. But you may, you're probably right in that sense. I mean, the, the, um, the, uh, it's interesting, there's a certain bad faith on the part of some people on the left, I think, ever since the Iraq war, when suddenly they start getting very nice about religion and saying very pleasant things about it, you know. And really, this is a kind of, you know, my enemy's enemy is my friend. You know, if Muslims are, you know, now the enemy of some of them, then, you know, some on the left, in a kind of bad faith, begin to say nice things about them. But in general, of course, 
the left, the political, the secular political left, has no more understood uh, issues of theology than old-style nineteenth-century rationalists like Richard Dawkins, who doesn't understand a thing about theology. Terry Eagleton and his book Culture and the Death of God is out now. You're listening to Free Thinking with me, Philip Dodd, and Radio 3's features broadcast at 6.45 on Sunday evenings are exploring the world's first godless thought systems. And this evening I'm discussing the resurrection of God with the philosopher Roger Scruton, the theologian Elaine Storkey and the historian of ideas Peter Watson. Uh, Peter, you're down the line. You just published a book called The Age of Nothing, How We Sought to Live Since the Death of God. And I think of this programme as being a version of, a modest version, I hasten to add, of Wallace Stevens' great poem, Thirteen Ways of Looking at a Blackbird. So we're going to go back over some of the territory that Terry Eagleton covered. As you listen to him, does Nietzsche strike you as the key figure when it comes to the announcement of the death of God? Yes, for a number of reasons. I mean, we forget that uh, evolution, which we associate indelibly with Darwin, was more of a German idea than a British idea. And Darwin's book went down much quicker and better in Germany than in in Britain. And it, uh, Nietzsche was writing at the time of a culture camp, to go back to the word culture, a fight between Catholics and uh, Protestants in Germany. So. It took off, and his style took off. And, of course, then he, caught, he, he was found to have syphilis, uh, which added a sort of a wild salting to his ideas. As w- were they the result of his illness or straightforward piece of, of rationalism? Um, but I think it's true to say that only since then have there been a, you know, a fair number of atheists, which is why... Um, in America, my book is called The Age of Atheists. Well, I wanted to um, ask you, though, what was it that Nietzsche said, as it were, oh, that made it so game-changing, to use the American language? Well, in his pithy way, he said, look, there's nothing nothing other than us. There's nothing met- metaphysical. There's no beyond. There's no heaven. We have to rely on ourselves. Uh, life is chaos, both out- external life and internal life what he called the cargo of life. Uh, We have to impose our will on it. This was his famous will to power. And uh, we can only expect what there is in this life. There's nothing beyond this life. And we must make the most of it. All joy, he said, once eternity, we must try to live a more intense life. And that that is all we have. That's all there is. Now, of course, you know, extraordinary writer that Nietzsche was, one writer doesn't shift a kind of cultural historical sensibility. What's the wider world into which Nietzsche wrote and then which generated so much change in the 20th century? Well, I think that the uh, obviously the Darwinian world was there. The origin of species has been out 20 years when... Um, uh, less actually, when Nietzsche made his uh, pronouncements, and I, I mentioned the the culture camp, and then there were all the changes, the beginning changes of modernism, that were looking upon the world in a in a new and a, a different way. I mean, most of modern painting, for instance, is totally secular, um, and the various other scientific developments. You can't hide the fact that science did had a a major influence. What, whatever uh, you may feel about it later. I think we may have just lost. Um, Skype is a wonderful invention, but not always, and especially not always on broadcast. So we may come back to Peter to talk more about Nietzsche and psychology as a kind of surrogate for religion. But in Peter's absence, let's turn to Roger Scruton, who now suddenly feels like um, uh, the person we desperately (laughs) need into this silence. Roger, I mean... Your book is called The Soul of the World, Mm. and it is an interesting fact that you and Eagleton, very different political animals, have written, as it were, not similar books, but books on the same subject at the same time. Why now for you? Why do you think there's so much writing about the kind of return of religion? Well, I I suppose in my case this um, this is the result of... thinking over many many years it's not it, it just happens to have come to this particular point now um i i think T- terry eagleton's book is much more what i would call history of ideas he's sh- he's showing the way in which religious ideas were 
as it were, displaced by secular ideas, but then those secular ideas began to take on the, the burden of religious feeling and, in the end, uh, brought us round to the same uh, sense of our destiny that the religious ideas had. And that's all very interesting, and I, I think I largely agree with, with a lot of what he said. M my book is really philosophy. It's about um, what is true in all this uh, uh, and um, uh, but, but you know this as well as I do in order to answer the question what is true you need to elbow out of this game the scientific account of what is true and part of the interest of this mm. book is you take on evolutionary <laughs> biology for instance um, absolutely I, I think but what m m my view very simply is that uh, the scientific worldview gives us the truth about the world uh, it, it says what is there, uh, and it, it, um, that it sets limits to what can be said. Uh, and it's a philosophical question, of course, whether you can transcend those limits, but I agree with Kant that you cannot. And, um, but nevertheless, I want to argue that that isn't the whole truth, that there is another way of looking at the world, uh, and we know this deeply and intimately from our own experience of each other. We can't look at each other uh, as uh, organisms obedient to the laws of physiology uh, all the time, or, or even any of the time. It's only rarely on the hospital bed that we can do this. I think it was Wittgenstein, although I can never find it, but I remember mm. it, who said that to look at the world as if it was a place of wonder was to see the world as a miracle. Mm. Am I right in saying for you the religious experience, and you're very clear very early in the book that you're not trying to defend religious practice or religious doctrine, but what you call a religious worldview, mm. that for you the religious experience is a way of looking at the world. It's to see it differently. Yes, uh, but to see it also in relation to those things in us that are most important to us, such as the, our sense of responsibility towards each other, the sense that we have to account for what we are and what we do and what we feel. Uh, and uh, that connects with something that Terry Eagleton was saying about culture, in fact, uh, that um, w when people like Schiller, I suppose, was the first really major thinker who thought this, uh, tr who tried to put culture in the place of, of religion. It was with this thought that this is something that can be shared between the, the high-level, high critical, reflective intellect and the ordinary person who, who sings and dances, etc. Uh, but I think one of the, the great catastrophes of our time is that we've seen that that won't work, that, that high culture has, has drifted upwards and popular culture drifted downwards, and there seems to be no connection between them. So is religion, uh, it's a 19th century <laughs> idea, a kind of glue? Well, uh, uh, Terry's uh, argument was that, that it, 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 uh, as it were, gave both to the priesthood who thought at the highest level, and to the ordinary person, a shared language and a shared conception of what mattered, uh, and um, a, a liturgical practice in which the highest thoughts and also the lowest feelings were both incorporated. He didn't quite put it in that way, but that, uh, that's the thought, thought, and I think that is a really very important feature of it. One, le one further question, then I want to bring Elaine in, and we found Peter in wherever digital cyberspace is... <laughs> For you, I mean, the the end of your very tough, the idea of an afterlife is a kind of an mm. absurdity. For you, God is a way of experiencing this world. Mm. The the afterlife yeah. idea is is of course the great yeah. crux, uh, and um, what I would say about that is that that on any understanding uh, uh, that. Uh, if, if there is an immortality that we that, that we participate in, it it can't be after the present because immortality must be outside time. So the whole idea there this is a, an image of something of something else uh, of a way of relating to the world which gives us another dimension of significance. That that's. Uh, of course, that's a mystical way of putting it, but I don't think one can do anything better than that. Well, then, we'll come back to the mystical, and I think there are two or three points that arise out of both what you said and Terry said, and I suppose one of them I want to start with, <laughs> Elaine, and uh, bring Peter in to our help is now with us, is this idea of its importance to the community. <laughs> both Terry and Roger, in different ways, have spoken of the value of the religion, in a sense, the irreplaceable value, the unique character of religion. 
Is that something you've just come from the Anglican community? <laughs> Methodists like me never took the Anglican community as seriously as I'm sure I should have done. But the truth about it is religion important primarily because of its kind of community dimension? Well, it depends on what we mean when we're talking about religion. If we mean by religion um, the sacred beliefs and worship and practices and theology uh, of a community, um, then obviously it's it's important to that particular community and it's important to Anglicanism and the Church of England and so on that we get our theology right and that our theology is practised out in our lives day by day. Um, absolutely. But in another sense, if, we, if by religion we mean something deeper and broader, rather, um, about worldviews, then it's important to everybody. because well, here... It's the second that is Roger and Terry in their very different ways. Mm. This isn't a question of mm. a group of Catholics, you know, needing shared beliefs. This is a sense that religion matters to the world. Yes, and here I would say it's not a it's not a case of science versus faith or psychology versus revelation or culture versus theology, but actually worldviews are underneath all of these things. So you approach psychology itself from a position of worldview where you've already asked and answered some fundamental questions, questions like who or what is God? Or what is it to be a human being? Um, what, what, what's the basis of morality? What's right with the world? What's wrong with the world? What might put it right? And these kinds of things, what is reality? And it's the answers to those questions that we bring as a prior framework of understanding to our sciences or to our psychology or even to our culture. And in that sense, um, well, religion is inescapable, not just important to a small community, but to everyone. Roger? Well, uh, yes, um... I think I, I understand what you're getting at, and I largely agree with it. But Peter Watson, in his book, quotes uh, that famous remark of Chesterton that uh, when men cease to believe in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I think that is a, that actually a very profound remark because what he is eff effectively saying is that the belief in God has a completely different function from beliefs uh, of a scientific kind, take it away uh, and uh, you've created a hole which has to be filled. Peter, uh, you're, you're with us now. Chesterton, how does, it, how does Chesterton look from your story? Well, I'd just like to put a little bit of context into this, you see. I don't think... Um, I enjoyed both uh, Roger and uh, Terry's books, but I think they're talking to each other rather than to anybody else. Um, religion is not... People are not getting more religious in the so-called advanced West. The world is getting more religious because poor countries who can't offer their inhabitants a secure, existentially secure life are getting more religious, whereas even America now is decree people who, who claim faith are getting smaller by about 1% a year. And by, you know, 2040... Uh, America, if it, rates go on as they are, um, even America would be primarily atheistic. So um, I think this, this whole debate is taking place within a world that's not listening. People are becoming more atheist in the developed West, and they're not really bothered by these ideas of the sacred or the transcendent. Well, listen, we um, only have 50 more nice minutes otherwise. But it's unreal to me. OK, well, let me just say... Just a couple of things, you know. I spend a lot of time in China. There are now more Protestants in China <laughs> than there are members of the Communist Party, as a Communist Party official said to me with some <laughs> despair, and this is a growingly uh, uh, rich country for all the inequalities. In the global south, Pentecostalism is the very largest movement of the poor in the world. So these are difficult uh, questions of quantification, but I take it... Roger, that what you're arguing is not affected by what Peter is saying, because what you're arguing actually is this is a necessary language that we need. People may become more atheistic, but the consequence of that is the impoverishment of us all. I, I, I think that's right. I, I, I don't dispute what uh, Peter just said, that in, indeed we in the affluent West are, uh, can deceive ourselves more easily than poor people, that, that we can survive without this dimension. 
in our lives. Uh, and it's not just the dimension of the sacred. It, going with the sacred is the idea of sacrifice. Uh, and people have to live by sacrifices in the, in the normal human condition. And one can go through these periods of luxury and abundance when one can forget that. But it, all of us come face to face with it in the end. And it's that aspect uh, of the human condition which I think will, al will always be there. Uh, and Can I ask Roger a question? You so, may indeed. Uh, I mean, is this a question of monotheism? Is there something special, do you think, about monotheism? I mean, all sorts of gods in the history of the world have mm. died, in Chaldea, in the Algonquin, mm. uh, in India, and even Theosipsistus in the Eastern Mediterranean in the early AD years was a monotheistic pagan god who's died. Mm. Why shouldn't a monotheistic god die? Well, of course, uh, um, gods, as you, you rightly say, they do die. I mean, it, it was, it's only a Christian community that could receive Nietzsche's statement that God is dead w with any uh, uh, credence, because, after all, Christians believe that that is true. They believed yeah. that for 2,000 years. <laughs> Elaine? It's at the very centre, the very heart of the Christian faith, uh, that Christ died on the cross as, as a saviour, as a redeem redeemer um, for the sins of humankind. So, so in that sense, there's no problem whatsoever in the death of God in that sense, um, because it actually means life for humankind. It means um, the rest of us flourish and find forgiveness and find peace and find meaning and find truth precisely through the death of God. So um, we can pray, um, knowing that we're praying to a personal being who is actually there, not a figment of imagination or a psychological construct. OK, well, we've so far talked very much about religion and the wider social world. There's also the religion and self, mm. that encounter. There are times, as I read your book, Roger, where feel, it feels to me like meeting God is like words with meeting one of those people he encounters on the streets mm. and they transform his life, you think in some way God is the foundation of the self? Well, uh, um, funnily enough, I think the other, it's the other way round. Um, although, of course, that is very dangerous thought because it goes into all sorts of heretical d directions. But uh, you used to get burnt for saying things yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Terry makes a very interesting point in his book about the um, attempts of people like Fichte and Hegel to rescue. Uh, the the structure of religion by founding it upon the on su the on subjectivity, uh, and Kierkegaard of course did the same or tried to do the same, uh, and he rightly says, look, the the, the subject is a nothing, uh, uh, and this is indeed what Sartre's message to the modern world, you know, that that that, that at the centre of our being there's this thing, le, le pour soi, the thing that the self-conscious being, and it's a nothing, so there's a nothing at the centre of my world, but actually. That's just the wrong thought. As soon as you take it seriously and try to understand exactly what self-consciousness uh, involves and the freedom that goes with it, you realise that you are situating yourself already on the edge of the natural world. Uh, and the, the, the idea that that world has an edge is the beginning of theology. Peter? No, I, I, I think what we're... I thought no might be your first God, word. ...but religion. Mm. And it's like Ronald Dworkin's recent book, uh, Religion Without God, and this mm. is what I think Terry and uh, Roger and maybe even Elaine are, are coming round to. Whereas when I was writing my book and I was telling people uh, what I was doing, a lot of people uh, just said, oh, I never think about God. I just, it just doesn't bother me. I just get on with my life. Now, maybe mm. that's the real atheism. Maybe that's the real modern condition. We're not seeking to replace something big. We've mm. learned to live with something or many, many things that are small, which is what I try mm. to show in my book, is that life, a meaningful life, is made up of hundreds, thousands, lots and lots of little things. And the search for something big and coherent is just not necessary. I mean, Elaine, do you think it's fair what Peter said, that actually the three of you in different ways want religious faith, it's just God that's the problem? No, God is no problem whatsoever for me. I'm a very faithful, orthodox believer. 
and I'm not I wouldn't even go um so far as to say that God isn't the very center of my existence and so yes I accept and uh, Roger's notion of the self as subject and I find that part of his book extremely moving what happens to the subject at death uh, when the subject becomes an object but we can never objectify ourselves because we can never get outside ourselves and look at ourselves as object and I I find this whole train of thought um not only liberating um but profoundly moving but for me the self is also fundamentally relational so as subject i'm experiencing myself in relationships and in relationship with the, the rest of creation of which i am a part and with in relationship with other people whom i love or don't love or whatever or struggle with um and fundamentally in relationship to the creator who made me so god is at the very center of myself and my relationships and gives meaning to the rest of them i mean for you so yes how peter we keep, uh, how is the difference in, how does religion look after the self in comparison with say the big development at the end of the 20th century the development of psychology well, which yeah. was, was particularly concerned with the self um how how do you see is there a difference in understanding between the psychological understanding of the self and yours I, I mean, you see, I find it very difficult to answer questions about religion in in abstract like this. Um, it's as though there is one thing called religion, but when you actually look at religion, there are religions which are fundamentally very different from each other. And if we're talking about a religion that expects the self to go out and exterminate the infidel in the name of God, then that's a very different kind of package and worldview from a, 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 a religion that says to the self, "You must love your neighbour as yourself," or that you must forgive your enemy and do the best for them so it's well, hard to answer those questions um but but trying to answer your question about psychology no i think the the best kind of psychology is fully in keeping with a christian worldview at least um that i espouse and and look at it gives us an understanding of relationships an understanding of sin an understanding of the importance of the past of childhood and so on and a flourishing learning to love yourself so that you can love your neighbor as yourself we actually we had this conversation with Giles Fraser, who oh. made a big, strong argument, actually, that psychoanalysis and religion were very close. We're coming to the end, Roger, and I suppose that the thing I want to ask you, in a sense, for you, religion, you keep speaking that there are experiences beyond contractual, mm. beyond the deal. Yeah. And in a way, you're trying to rescue experiences, aren't you, that can go beyond the way we live. Whether there's a God involved in this seems to me secondary. Well, it's certainly secondary to my purpose in this book, which was a, I was trying to give the, uh, a, f a philosophy of the human being uh, which uh, lays bare the different layers of consciousness and the different layers of relation that, in which we engage. And, and I, I argue that, we, of course, we, we live in a world of covenants, of, co of contracts, mm. but we live also in a completely different world, a world of sacrifices, which is, which is called up from us at certain times and in certain ways, and that, that that is part of our nature to be prepared for this. But we don't need, and I'm afraid and this is a cruel way of thinking, but we don't need to name that as God. Uh, <laughs> That's a very interesting uh, observation. We do need to name it, uh, and the only name that we have is that one, although the, the, the Muslims have 99 beautiful names. <laughs> Roger Scruton, Peter Watson, and I'm sorry to have lost you, Peter, and Elaine Stalky. Thank you all very much. Indeed.